كل ميسر لما خلق له so every person is designed has been made uh, facilitated for that which he was created if you seek your purpose then you will live your life to the fullest but until a person doesn't reflect or doesn't know themselves they know nothing as imam sadiq said jahilun bi nafsi jahilun bi kulli shay what is the key of your existence this is the question we all have to ask ourselves is the key to your own existence if you don't have that key it's like you're living on the surface you're living a superficial life i was only sent right innama only sent to complete the makaram al akhlaq the highest level of morality not just any akhlaq not fadail makaram makaram is like a special type of akhlaq It is the highest level of, of akhlaq. I mean, Islam and religion is one of the manifestations of God. It is not the only manifestation. Allah came with different, you know, hundreds of thousands of messengers, each manifested the divinity in their own time and place. If a person has nothing to do with deen or Islam, they can have a relationship with God. and maybe Allah created them for a specific thing that you and I don't realize we'll find that these ideas of nationhood of of madhab of tashayyu and tasannun all of these things are limiting and they are very problematic when you look at it from the because the hakim the hakim the wise person looks beyond all of this every human being has conflict from the day they were born until the day they die there's conflict there's a conflict on the day they're born the child is crying when it comes out of the womb it's not happy it was happy in the womb it was comfortable now it's into the world the mother's in pain and the child is crying that's all conflict it's the whole scene is conflict the child comes into this world in conflict and it dies in conflict how because he doesn't want to leave this world but but the angel come and he snatches the 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 soul so there's this conflict between staying in this world and wanting to and leaving because you will never become a good fighter until you learn to take a, a punch you get hit in the face and you understand how to deal with that you have to get hit because when you actually get hit in in, in a real situation then you'll know you'll keep your balance but it is a process of arriving at a unification at it is arriving at the knowledge and the gnosis of the oneness of being the oneness of god's existence to to move from a state of multiplicity into a state of unity and oneness and and to see all things as one so that is the nature of tawhid so is tawhid wujudi and this my friends is ultimately the the message of the prophets This is all they wanted to do is they wanted to get man out of a animalistic barbaric state into a state which God intended which is the human form. If a person strives for the hikmah, the wisdom, the meaning, they make that the criteria, then they'll find wisdom in all things, not just the Quran, not just your own text. And if you make wisdom the criteria for truth, then you can look at the bible you can look at the the torah you can look at other religious traditions you can look at anything in the world 90% of what you're doing all this technology is happening in the middle east the buildings the the bulldozers the uh, the, the the transmission the transmission of sciences the ulum everything that's happening is from the aql it's not from quran and hadith So don't fool yourselves in thinking that this, you know, this Quran and Hadith is, the, is all that I need without the aql. Qom Lut and Fa'ad and Thamud. What relevance does that have for today? Travel in your mind. Travel through different schools of thought, different philosophies, different time periods, different thinkers. So similarly to travel through the Bible, see the different, the different wisdom. especially the bible i mean i i strongly suggest that muslims should read the bible there's this is the statement of prophet isa alayhi salam the greatest messenger after the prophet muhammad peace be upon him we're very preoccupied as muslims in the external aspects of religion 
So I want to take this opportunity to emphasize that religion is zahir and batin. Just like Allah says, huwa al-awwal wal-akhir wa zahir wal batin. This is why the Prophet says, At-tafakkur sa'atin khayrun min ibadat sab'in sana. One hour of contemplation how much ground you can cover spiritually, inside, intellectually, in your qalb. This is where the heart of Islam is. This is the heart, is that the batin that cultivates your interior. He who cultivates their, this is the jihad and nafs. The nafs is not external, it's, it's internal. Then when the nafs becomes rectified, then the limbs become rectified. Then your ibadat becomes rectified. Then your relationships with your neighbors and your and your friends and your your family becomes uh, rectified. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nurahibu bikum. في سلسلة حوارات فكرية ومعرفية على قناة حيرة. So welcome to this interview and today we are interviewing Dr. Mukhtar Ali from London from the United Kingdom. Dr. Mukhtar is a lecturer in Islamic studies at the Department of Religion and University of Illinois um, um, Urbana Champaign. And uh, Dr. Mukhtar also is a fellow at School of Advanced Studies at the University of London. He received his PhD in Arabic and Persian Sufi writings from the University of California in Berkeley. Along with his expertise in Sufism, ethics, philosophy, he is a licensed practitioner, practitioner, practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, having received his doctorate from Pacific College of Oriental Medicine. So his focus in medicine complements his study of mysticism as he delves into the esoteric aspects of the human body, the spiritual origins of disease and their ap appropriate treatment. Um, he has several books, he produced several works, which will, uh, some of them are forthcoming, um, a translation and a commentary of a very well-known Sufi text, which is um, Dawood al-Qaisari's introduction of Fusus al-Hikam, and he has an introduction and co commentary on this book also. Um, also another book of Abdurrahman Zaljami, uh, which is selected texts uh, commenting on Naqsh uh, al-Fusus Naqsh um, al-Fusus uh, I think yeah, yeah. and uh, a third book also of Sayyid Haider al-Amuli which one of his major books uh, which is uh, the, com the Compendium of Mysteries and, found and Fountainhead of Light mm -hmm. what we say in Arabic Jami'u al-Asrar wa man ba'il wa man ba'il anwar um, so welcome, Doctor, and it's an honor having you with us today. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, hopefully, we can have a, a fruitful conversation today, inshallah. Inshallah. So, yeah, Doctor, yeah. you have interest in the works of uh, Sayyid Haider al-Amuli and his theories, so we'll just try yes. to discover some of them uh, today throughout our talk. And uh -huh. uh, I will, our talk will be about truth, wisdom, beauties of mysticism and your fan between academic involvement and yeah. real embodiment. So we'll try to focus on the importance of Irfan in, uh, in our life. Yeah. Um, and in human beings' life, not only Muslim people's lives. So, um, so we'll talk like different, um, uh, from different uh, gardens. Um, Ibn Arabi, Haider al-Amuli, uh, al-Ansari, and Manazal al-Sa'irin, or also how to open ourselves to different manifestations of wisdom and truth as uh, this هذا البيت من الشعر يقول for everything there is a sign indicating that he is one وفي كل mm -hmm. شيء له آية تدل على أنه واحد so in the beginning uh, Dr. Mukhtar tell us more about you your academic and spiritual mm -hmm. path and why you chose this field in your studying and the, what, what's the importance of concentrating on the field uh, of Irfani or Sufi studies in the current time that we live in um, until you ended translating such uh, very important books. Uh, I also knew that you know at least four languages, Arabic, mm -hmm. Persian, Urdu, and uh, English, uh, which is a great uh, grace and ni'mah for any person to know several languages. I guess uh, that a person may surely widen his horizons and way of thinking in a sense that he could understand an idea from different angles or 
even he can engage intellectually from um, from different sides and understanding an idea. So in the beginning, uh, tell us uh, about your uh, experience um, from early age, m maybe also. Sure. So um, again, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, well, as far as uh, my uh, personal trajectory in in this field of Islamic studies, I, I, you know, this is a, actually, to be honest, a very difficult question to answer because you you have to really look at, you know, why did you end up making the the decision that you did, or you can it can it can be said that you know Allah chose you for a certain path over another path, because there were many options available and people have many options in life. So why do we choose one path over another path? So this goes back to some, you know, deeper spiritual mystical things about, you know, um, one's, you know, this, as, as the prophetic hadith says, Kullum lima leh. So every person is designed, has been made, uh, facilitated for that which he was created. So, you know, perhaps this is why I was created to, to pursue a path of scholarship and study and to investigate into the uh, unearth the teachings of Islam, the outward and the inward teachings to uh, to write about those teachings to help other people access those teachings in English, um, and uh, you know make make it available for the for the modern age. So I felt on some level that this was my calling, and and I I, I think that every field and every profession, whether it's medicine or it's you know something um you know whether it's a professional field or a a working field like uh, something that uses uh, your hands and an art an artistry every profession has value and is needed in 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 society uh, this is just something that i've chosen myself for or that suits my temperament and my own personal um you can say life philosophy yeah Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. doctor, tell us more about mm -hmm. the places you studied and the teachers who affected you in your life or, or maybe some masters that you were searching for and you found them in a place. Or, so tell us more about maybe the, 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 your journey. Sure. Uh, well, I can say that my, my, my first influence was a college professor, my dissertation advisor, Professor Hamid Algar. Um, he was the first person to really, uh, you know, help me and guide me in, in helping me decide what I wanted to do. I remember, um, you know, uh, just being uh, the, an advisor at an undergraduate level, but also later on, I, I studied with him d uh, during my, my doctoral studies as well. So he was instrumental in shaping the early my early understanding of really life purpose, you know, what it, what, it, what it is to define a purpose in your life and follow that purpose. Um, and I think that's really the most important thing a person can do in their life. That is the fundamental, single most important uh, piece of advice I can give to young people and even, you know, uh, uh, really all people of all ages is find your purpose. If you seek your purpose, then you will live your life to the fullest. Because this is why Allah has created you. He's given you many options, and it, just because He created you for a certain thing, it doesn't mean that you will automatically find that purpose. So finding that purpose is really the essence of what the Prophet says, Man arafa nafsa, faqad arafa rabba. So he who came to know himself, this self-knowledge, meaning for find your life, finding your purpose, then he came to find Allah, find God, find his Lord through his purpose. So the purpose of the self relates directly to the knowledge of God. It relates directly to your masira, your, your trajectory, and all the good things that come to you and you are able to do in life. It comes through finding your purpose. So my first influence was my professor, Hamid Algar. And then I, I traveled to Iran, and I actually traveled to the Middle East and Syria and Egypt and these places, and I studied Arabic. Um, but then um, I had uh, another important influence. Um, his name is uh, Sayyid Wathiq. He was a, a religious scholar, Allah yarhamhu, 
Uh, he's passed away, but he was a he was a great man, and uh, he um, you know I didn't have much interaction with him, but he gave me some critical advice, some life changing advice, and because of those er- initial steps, um, I was able to I I think set the right foot, put put, put my best foot forward. He said, study Arabic, first study Arabic, and then go to Qom. And a lot of students, they went, to, they went directly to the, the seminary to study religious studies, and they didn't have Arabic. Um, and their Arabic wasn't strong, and they could never improve their Arabic while living in Iran. It's, it's almost impossible. You're living in a, in a country that you know, speaks Farsi. You may be able to you know, get to some level of proficiency in Arabic, but you'll never have it if you, unless you live in an Arab country. So that move was really the best move I ever made. When I studied Arabic, it opened the door to the real teacher that I was waiting for, uh, who was in Qom. He's an Iraqi teacher. His name is uh, Sheikh Akram al-Majid. And ever since I've studied with him, I've been with him for 20 years now. So he's been my main spiritual guide, my main teacher. Uh, you can say Murshid and Sheikh and, you know, the uh, fatherly figure, uh, all these different things that we, we attribute to our spiritual mentor. And so uh, this is, the, this is the, the main teacher that I found in Qom, who I've been with ever since. And, and nothing against or, or taking away from the other teachers who taught me in, in, in Qom. But, you know, sometimes you have like one, one teacher who takes you on. He takes you under their wing. And so this is the situation with me and, and my, my, my sheikh. Uh, and uh, yeah. yeah, you were mentioning something? No, I was just saying, you know, then we, we studied with, uh, in Iran, we studied uh, with Persian teachers, uh, we studied Farsi, um, we studied, you know, Rumi and Hafid, and we, and, um, you know, a, a lot of, uh, so it was, you know, anyone who knows the, the atmosphere in, in the seminary in Qom and Najaf and these places, even in Az- Azhar, um, any place where there's a religious seminary, there's a lot of different things going on. There's people coming from the West, from the East, from Malaysia. It's a very international crowd. It is very, um, you know, it has its its issues and its problems. I'm not saying that, but overall, it was, a, it was a very enriching experience, and it really was a foundational experience for me. Mm-hmm. So we studied the classical traditional curriculum in the Hausa and in, in Qom logic and usul and these subjects. But I gravitated personally to the mystical sciences, the Arfan and, and philosophy. And this is what we started studying with uh, Sheikh Akram. So that's um, in short, you know, uh, if anyone wants to know, that's how it all began. So, so mostly it's an influence from the, your teacher, Sheikh Akram al-Majid, that you went into the field of uh, ethics and Irfan and Sufism and all the spiritual dimension in Islam, and then you dig uh, more in this path? Well, look, to be honest, I was searching for this even before I came to, to the Middle East. I was, looking, I was reading books on Sufism in my undergraduate days while I was studying with Professor Algar and taking courses. I was reading books with, by William Chedek and, and Professor Murata, Sachiko Murata, um, you know, uh, James Morris. So people know these scholars, uh, Professor Sayyid Hussain Nasser. All, these are great scholars in Western academia who have done incredible things to promote the teachings of Islam and, and this, you know, Ibn Arabi or, or Sufism in general. And, um, and so I was heavily influenced by that. This is before I studied Arabic, before I was going into the, 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 the texts themselves. One of my favorite books of all time is this one by, it's called The Tao of Islam. If anyone has a chance to look over this book, it's filled with gems, treasures from the whole tradition of, of Sufism, not just Ibn Arabi or any one particular thinker, but all of the great, amazing scholars um, and so well translated. So this was a major influence for me. Mm-hmm. I think it's a book of uh, Sachiko Morota. Yes, that's right. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, ama- truly amazing, amazing work. It's encyclopedic. And uh, that's, a, that's a huge influence on me. And then that's, from that, I was already looking for a teacher. I mean, you know, years before I found, you know, my teacher, I was, I was deeply, I, that's the only reason why I went to Iran. Because I was like, I know there's shuyukh there, and I'm going to find one, inshallah. So I was, that's my whole goal, because I knew the importance of a teacher. 
If you want to study anything, you have to have a teacher. I mean, this is, this is common sense. If you want to study medicine, you have to have a curriculum. You have to have a mentorship. And, and, and this is a difference between two types of learning. Most people, they go to the university and they, they take classes. But everyone knows that this is just an undergraduate. This is the first level of education is you take general classes, even specialist classes. If you want to become an expert in anything, whether it's calligraphy or music or medicine, you have to have a mentorship. You have to train with someone. And the highest levels of any field, it always comes through this type of uh, inheritance, this, this type of transmission of knowledge from the master to the student. This is uh, something which is really rooted actually in our own tradition in Islam. What is the whole prophetic model? What is the concept of wilaya? It is this transmission, transmission of knowledge, transmission of authority, transmission of, of uh, spiritual teachings from one, you know, uh, saint Nabi, Wali, whatever, whatever you want to call it, it's a transmission from one to the next. And this is an essential part of the Islamic tradition, whether it's Sunnism or Shiism. It doesn't make a difference between the madhahib. We all agree on this concept of transmission of knowledge. It's a human phenomenon. So anyway, so that's what I was looking for. And, and alhamdulillah, you know, um, this is something that I was able to participate in. Uh, great doctor and then we can talk more about the importance uh, of the sheikh and the idea of the murshid or a guider in the uh, whole Irfani tradition uh, yes. but you mentioned the uh, translation and the book of Sachi Komorata because she's working on um, she translated uh, an effort uh, that is done in explaining uh, Sufism and Islam in the Chinese mm -hmm. language so yeah uh, but my question because you have uh, experience in translating such uh, very complicated uh, Irfani books so mm. and as the uh, people of hermonetics or people of that will say that translating is um, inventing or creating a new uh, a new text in a, in, a, in a new kind of beauty so mm. so it needs involvement it's need it needs a, fl a flavor of, of, of the person um, uh, so yeah tell us more if in a summary about uh, um, your interest in translation and the works that uh, you, you've done in translation or, or, or yeah. the, the, the topic of translation because people feel no I am just uh, um, uh, changing the language only okay translation is a is a it's a very enjoyable task because uh, outwardly you are engaging with the text you're looking at the word you're looking at the structure you're looking at you're looking at, you're, you're analyzing the text at a very uh, rich level. You're not just reading it, it's more of an active process you, to engage with the material. Um, and you learn a lot from translation. You learn new words, you learn new concepts, you investigate ways of, of usage, because Arabic is a very rich language. And you'll find that it's, you know, the same word needs to be translated multiple ways in different contexts. And so it makes you think about how the author is using that word. It makes you think about how the Quran is using that word or the, or the Hadith is using that word. For example, the word Ain. Ain has, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of meanings. And, and which context is being used? Ain the eye, Ain the spring, Ain the spy, Ain, you know, to mean Shay itself. Uh, essence that is so there's so many ways of expressing ayn. So this is just one example and there's an Arabic is filled. It's so it's a very rich and deep language. That's the first point. So it helps you to engage with the text. The second point I can say as a, as a metaphysical point, as an Arfani point that, that in every age, there's a tarjuman, there's a translator and the Nebi, the prophet is a translator for his time. He is translating the, the, the ayat of Allah, the jalliyat, the manifestations of God, in a form which the people understand. Why is it that, that, that the Qur'an came in Arabic? Because the Prophet was an Arab. And so, he, so the Qur'an came in a language which, which corresponded with the Prophet and vice versa. The, the prophet was created or he was sent to a people um, in the language that God chose, which was Arabic. 
So in any case, the prophet is a tarjuman. He's a he's a translator of the divine signs for his people. We have the saying also about awliya. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. So similarly, just like the prophet is the divine translator, the wali is the translator for his time. And the silsila and the chain of wilaya continues. So for every time, for every era and every age, there must be a translator of the divine signs. And this is, goes back to the a concept of the shaykh or the murshid. The shaykh is one, what is the purpose of the shaykh? The shaykh is for one, a coach, a guide, uh, a teacher, a mentor. But ultimately, all of these qualities combine in the concept of the translator. The shaykh is translating the ayat, the divine signs. This is what makes him a shaykh ilahi. The difference between an ordinary shaykh and a shaykh rabbani. This is the this is the word Imam Ali used, right? Al alimun um, rabbani. rabbani. What is this alimun rabbani? Why does he attribute rabbani, rabb, to the to the, to the alim, not just alim, adi, normal scholar? He says no, alimun rabbani. He's a divine scholar. He's a divinely inspired scholar. He's this is the, this is the sheikh. He's the one who Allah is communicating with. He's speaking to God on some level. He's reading the signs. He understands the language of the unseen. He, under, he speaks the language of the ghayb. He understands that and then he translates that for the, for the disciple, for the murid. And he's saying, okay, do this now, do this now. This is what you should do uh, in order to progress and to, to understand God. So translation has a, such a deep spiritual meaning. Huh? Uh, yeah. And we can talk more about the uh, miracle of the Prophet and the Quran al-Karim and how it is a translation of the great uh, haqaiq uh, uh, later. Um, Dr. Olson, your CV, um, something very interesting. I didn't know about you before, which is uh, your interest in traditional Chinese uh, medicine and mm. the spiritual medicine and uh, uh, studying the human body and the spiritual origins of the diseases and the treatments so uh, we won't talk about this because uh, this is a whole story itself uh, so just give sure. us a summary about your interest so medicine is if you if you remember that uh, the the prophets they themselves were healers medicine is is a healing a healing for the human body and the the sheikh is considered to be a a tabib ruhani he's a, a physician of the spirit so this is one of the terms that we use to describe a sheikh because he heals the sick souls every person who comes to to the path every human being has disease has illness physical as well as spiritual those diseases they don't manifest all the time until maybe later on in life until the body starts to break down and similarly the diseases of the soul also are there inside the human being you acquire things from the environment from your parents from your culture from television from watch you know uh, you're you're inundated with with different things which cause which are the origins of disease and you yourself are one of the origins of your disease as imam ali says right uh, I don't remember the, the exact poem. Um, uh, something like that. Okay, this is a famous poem, Imam Ali. And so he's saying that your cure is within you, but you don't see it. Your illness is within you. But you don't feel it. I recall other sayings, but, but this is, uh, you're talking about Ada also. Yeah, Da and Dawa. He, re he refers to these two things, Da and Dawa. They're both inside of you. You don't see that and you don't feel it. So this is a, this is a, fa a famous thing. You can, you can look it up online. Now, that being said, illness and cure is a part of human existence. Just as there are physical illnesses, there are spiritual illnesses. So there is a correspondence between the physical and the spiritual. And one form of medicine is Chinese medicine. And this Chinese medicine is just a type of medicine which also looks at the correspondence between the inward, the botan, 
and the zahir. If you look at the, the, the actual text of Chinese medicine, they say that all the illnesses begin in the heart, in the qalb. It's a very spiritual medicine. It is rooted in a spiritual practice. And it speaks about, you know, the, the energies of the human being, intentions, and, and all of these things we can find correspondences and corroborations in, in, in our own literature, in, in Quran and Hadith. But that requires a separate study. We have to see, you know, what are the overlaps? Wh wh where are the parallels between these two different types of medicine? So that's another subject. But in general, to, to summarize the idea of medicine and why it is important, this type of medicine, traditional medicine, always looked and, and considered this, the soul and the spiritual dimension of man in the process of healing and cure. It was never devoid of the spiritual side of the human being. The biggest illness now and today that's in, in the world is depression. Depression is one of the, the greatest problems that humanity is facing now. And, and modern medicine considers it to be a physical problem, but it is a spiritual problem. It's 90% spiritual and 10% uh, physical. Human being physical... is not a, a robot, it's not a mechanical thing that you can deal with it only. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, the, the, the mind is a powerful, powerful force that is, say, housed in the body. It controls the body. It is affected by the body. And yet at the same time, it is independent of the body. So to understand the mind-body connection, this is essential both in Islamic spirituality as well as medicine. And this is one thing that is lost in, in our own understanding of, of the deen of Islam. We don't consider the physical dimension and physical well-being and the ayat that Allah has placed uh, in the physical realm and how that affects our spiritual well-being. This is lost in our, in our tradition. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, so, a person should take care of his body and all the aspects that are related to his body because even in his spiritual ascendance, uh, the bodily issues, uh, they have a great role. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, doctor, the sentence mm -hmm. you are referring to is da'uka fika wa ma tubsiru that's right, yes, thank you very much, perfect, yeah. Uh, we have also a saying from the Prophet, or a, a saying that describes a, the Prophet, I think maybe from Imam Ali, when he says, طبيب, طبيب قد أحكم mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly, so, yeah. so the, the Prophets and the Saints, were they were, uh, you know, physicians, both of the of the physical realm as well as, but ultimately there were there were physicians of the soul of the soul of the qalb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we normally say like wa salatu wa salam ala tabibi nufusina wa habibi qulubina Muhammad. We say uh, we say tabibi. That's right, exactly. This is this is this is part of our tradition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No but question. also people would say that, um, for example, when uh, prophets or even Imam Ali when he was sick when he was. Uh, um, uh, in his uh, the the Firash al Maut, he ordered uh, the best doctor to come and check on him. So that people say uh, that um, medicine and other um, type of uh, knowledge is not from the Islam or religion because يعني هناك تخصصات وهناك علوم أخرى هي خارج الإسلام. الإسلام يعتني بالهداية أو يعني some people would argue like this also. Let me let me say if I can say something on that. The idea that Islam is limited to Sharia or only Hidayah, only spirit, is, in my view, fundamentally wrong. Islam concerns Haqiqah. Islam is looking at reality. Islam is trying to guide people through wujud, through existence. Not just the prayer mat and, and the mosque. This is just one manifestation of Islam. A deen, deen is, is you know, the, the word deen itself, you, uh, in Arabic, you know, is, is behavior. It, right? As the, as the hadith says, you are dealt with. Kama to deen to dan. So this deen means uh, movement. It means tariq. It means way. It means behavior. It means... Mukafat, like uh, 
um, you do something, to, you know, do unto others as others will do unto you. So it has multiple applications, but ultimately someone, an intelligent person, is not just looking at spiritual life independently of existence. Spiritual life encompasses work, encompasses family, encompasses inheritance, encompasses neighbors and nation and politics. Everything is encompassed in deen. It's haqiqah, reality. Mm-hmm. So a person is cannot divorce Hidayah from reality. It's one and the same. Allah is controlling the universe. His asma are within all things. And and this is how if we look at Deen in, in this, we, then we start to investigate all things, and we see that that and this is the this is the way the ulama in the past they were they the the, the scholars of the past were investigating metaphysics and astronomy and medicine and architecture and mathematics and alchemy and all sorts of fields. And they were, they were Muslim scholars or Islamic scholars. They were at the same time theologians as well as mathematicians, as well as physicians. So they did not divorce religion from the, the pursuit of knowledge of the world. It was one and the same. Knowledge is a single thing. We have great masters, great examples. For example, Sheikh Al Baha'i, he was an engineer. He was uh, working on art and music, and he was a great mystic. He was a poet. He was a politician, and he, uh, as well as Al uh, Mufti uh, and Al Qadi and other ulum uh, also. So uh, this is a great introduction to start with uh, talking about your idea. There is an idea that you insist on, which is uh, Irfan cares mainly about knowing Hakika, not only about studying this alim or this book or that theory. So it's a bridge that should help us to uh, know our path, uh, our path towards Hakika, and also um, you say that Irfan looks at the meaning. Um, so we should seek uh, meaning in the beginning and not uh, other things. Right. I, I, I'm because Irfan is considered to be a, a hidden, mysterious science. It is considered to be uh, maybe like an occult discipline. Um, many people misunderstand it. <clears throat> Irfan is simply Ma'rifatullah. And that Ma'rifatullah, Ma'rifatullah means knowledge of God, gnosis of God, understanding God. And as, we, as, as the Prophet mentioned, that knowledge comes from knowing the self. So Irfan essentially is knowing the self. Knowing yourself and your place in existence and your relation to God. So all of these things are stacked one on top of the other. But it begins with knowledge of the self. This is the ultimate statement of Irfan. Irfan begins with this statement. It begins and it ends with the statement. But this is the beginning of Irfan. So Irfan is not, or Sufism as they say in, in Western academia, the Sawwuf, and Irfan in sort of like the Shi'i tradition and the Sawwuf and the other, you know, academic traditions, whatever you want to call it, it's not only reading Ibn Arabi. It's not reading Rumi. It's not reading, you know, um, the different Orafa, Hushayri, and so on and so forth. These are textbooks are, that are guides that help you to understand the mystical worldview. They contain ma'arif, types of knowledge, secrets, illuminative knowledge. They contain wisdom. They contain truths, deep truths, universal truths. So they must be studied. But Irfan is not exclusive to the study of those texts. You can memorize Ibn Arabi. You can memorize the poems of Hafiz and Rumi. You can memorize the Quran and Hadith. But until a person doesn't reflect or doesn't know themselves, they know nothing. As Imam Sadiq said, Jahilun bi nafsi, Jahilun bi kulli shay. This is a powerful statement. So the converse of Manaanafa nafsa is this statement Jahilun bi nafsi, Jahilun bi kulli shay. So he who is ignorant of himself is ignorant of all things, meaning that he may be a scientist, or she may be a, a, a physicist, a mathematician, or a great arif, or, or not an arif, I'm sorry, like a faqih a scholar, a marja. But if you don't know yourself, 
if you don't understand the nature of the soul, what are you? What are what are what is the things that motivate you? What is your path to God? What is the key of your your existence? What is the key of your existence? This is the question we all have to ask ourselves. Is there a miftah? Just like we have, everything has a miftah, everything has a key. Quran has a key. What is the key of the Quran? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's the key. Miftah al-Quran. And miftah al-Mufati, it's the key of all keys, is this statement, Bismillah. But the, this is a general term. Things have keys. The house has a key. The car has a key. People's hearts have keys. If you want to get the key to someone's heart, there's a, there's a way to get to someone. Right? This is what advertisers are, are, are thinking about all the time. What is the key to selling this product? What do people want to see? What do people want to uh, feel when they see an advertisement? So they're looking for the key. So Allah has key, has keys. And that's why he says, مفاتيح الغيب. He refers to the unseen and he says, مفاتيح الغيب. The keys to the unseen. So don't you think you have a key? What is the key to, what's the niftah of my, my existence? What is the key to your existence? So until we find that key or those keys, we will never know ourselves. The, the, our, our soul will be locked up. So Arfan is the study to try to find that key or those keys. At least there should be one key that opens all the other locks. For sure there's one key. Great. And that is the most important knowledge you can have in your life, without a doubt, is the key to your own existence. If you don't have that key, it's like you're living on the surface. You're living a superficial life. You haven't really opened your soul. You haven't, uh, you haven't excavated the depth of your being. Didn't God say in the Quran, وَعَلَّمَ Adam al asma kullaha? Not just Adam alayhi salam, Adam meaning insan. Mankind, well, all of insan, insan has been given the asma, all of, all of the divine names, has been given so much potential. But we need to unlock that key, uh, unlock those locks with the right key. And this is what the Shaykh is doing. He's trying to help you to find that key. He's trying for you to discover that key. The shaykh will never open you directly. You have to do it yourself, but he will teach you how to do it. And so this is, this is the shaykh, a real shaykh, a true shaykh will teach you how to open the locks. He will not open them for you because a hakim doesn't do that kind of thing. A real shaykh is a hakim, a, a sage, a wise person. The Hakim will teach you how to do something rather than do it for you. Because if he does it for you, then you haven't arrived at your insaniya, your, your humanity. Your humanity is to actualize yourself. This is where the human being is a human being. Not because someone does it for him. If he can do it himself or she can do it herself, then, then you can say, wow, this is a human being. Wow. MashaAllah, you have done it yourself. Doctor, then in this people... context, I think um, huh? uh, an important question that we can ask going back to the academic studies that there is yeah. a trend in academia which deals with Arafan, like historians, as, as you mentioned, like Ibn Arabi said, Rumi said, Mullah Sadr said, another Arif disagreed, and, and these old stuff. So uh, how do you analyze the, the kind of elite academic societies in the West, which now... Uh, there is a, the growing environment of studying Sufism and Arafan and, uh, and such stuff. Firstly, does it reflect a great thirst to spirituality? And secondly, uh, is it open to ordinary people and uh, all different kinds of people? Or it's elite only? And maybe this critique uh, uh, can be applied to Qom and other traditional schools and institutes in the, in the Islamic world also. In any type of learning, there's always the danger of theory over practice. The practice is the more difficult aspect of, of, uh, of any pursuit, to practice. So theory is relatively easy to acquire, and this is why this is usually the first place where people read books and they, they study. 
whereas practice becomes more difficult, it requires really struggling with the nafs. Jihad and nafs, this is what it is, jihad and nafs, jihad. That's why, you know, the Prophet called it jihad al-akbar. The greater jihad was a struggle against the self, nothing else. But your, your jihad and nafs could also be, you know, talab al-ilm, seeking knowledge could be, you know, jihad al-akbar for some people. Because you know, they don't have an inclination to studying and, and learning and whatnot. So in academia, um, oftentimes people will pursue and the, the, the scale of knowledge will overweigh the practice. Now, to be fair, most uh, people I've met in who are truly studying uh, the Sawol for Arfan in academia, I found them to be also practitioners. And they have a practice. They may not uh, overtly state it or or publicize it, but they do have a, a have a practice. And I found that to be mostly the case. There are instances where you find people who who just write about this, the material um, without any practice. And, and remember, practice does informs your theory. So if you don't have a practice, then it becomes apparent in your speech and your writings that uh, this person is shallow. It doesn't have depth, doesn't have a subtlety, doesn't know the, the matter, the material. They're just writing, um, you know, copy pasting what this scholar said and that scholar said. So that's 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 there as well. But um, oftentimes, if you look at very some some quality writing, you'll find that those people who have uh, they have a practice, and um, that you will see there's a you know uh, a nafas. A nafas means there's like a, a spirit, uh, a ruhiya in their writings. And this is one Rahman, of the ways. The breath of uh, Rahman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, you know, they say the dhok. Dhok is a very a key word that's used in, in mystical sciences. Dhok is like a taste, a flavor. You, you, you can't be an outsider while, de while, de while dealing with such a knowledge and stuff. Well, there's levels. Again, there's levels. You know, there's levels of, of how... How, how close, you know, you come to Ma'arif and what is the, what is the quality of the Ma'arif, the dif different types of knowledge. Um, what are the different kinds of knowledge? Like, for example, there's, you know, Ilm al-Firasa, Ilm al-Manam, there's, there's Ta'wil al-Quran, there's, there's so many different branches of learning within uh, Tasawwuf. But ultimately, you know, those are ulum, those are secondary sciences. Ultimately, a person, you know, wishes to to rectify let me let me be clear the, the purpose of arfan isn't to acquire power or knowledge for its own sake it is to rectify your morality this is the ultimate goal of islam and arfan right uh innama what is it innama bu'ithu li utamim makaram al akhlaq i was sent the prophet peace be upon him said I was only sent, right? Innama, only sent to complete the makaram al akhlaq the highest level of morality. Not just any akhlaq, not fadail, makaram. Makaram is like a special type of akhlaq. It is the highest level of, of akhlaq, and, and akhlaq means ethics, morality. So, Doctor, you, you talked yep. about um, uh, discovering yourself, uh, actualizing yourself, mm. um, uh, finding wisdom. And here uh, I'll ask a question. So what kind of pluralism can be found in Arfan? So I think you have an interesting idea to say here about the importance of looking for wisdom and opening um, yourself to the manifestations of wujud, God, and truth that are all around us. And not limit ourselves to some ideological understandings or mm. prejudice uh, perspectives about religion and reality. Maybe many of religious people or some are raised in a way that they are afraid to live and travel and gain knowledge and wisdom in all different kinds and, uh, of chances and opportunities that are available in, in our lives. So, so we stay uh, narrow or, or, or limited. So, so what kind of pluralism can be found uh, in Irfan and respecting the path of other people who are trying to search to God all from different places and we have this wisdom that the paths to God are as many uh, as many as human breaths I mean Islam and religion is one of the manifestations of God 
It is not the only manifestation. Allah came with different, you know, hundreds of thousands of messengers. Each manifested the divinity in their own time and place. Now, our belief as Muslims is that, yes, Prophet Muhammad is, brought the last message. But it doesn't, just because Islam is a phenomenon, it is what we consider to be the complete religious uh, deen or the way to God. It doesn't mean that, that God is limited to Islam. Islam is a barnamaj, it's a, it's a program. God is greater than that. God is there for the believers and the unbelievers. He is nourishing them, the asma or are, 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 are unbeliever in, in the sense that even if, if, if a person has nothing to do with the deen or Islam, they can have a relationship with God. And maybe Allah created them for a specific thing that you and I don't realize. So when we as Muslims think that Islam is the only way, this is fundamentally problematic because we're limiting God's authority in wujud. Wujud is existence. So the creatures, they come to God through their own means. And so this is one, this is one uh, principle or one idea. Okay? That it is common sense that that the creatures have a way to God and a God has a way to them that defies your understanding and my understanding. If we think the only way to God is Islam and Deen and, and Salah and Siyam, then we are limiting God's ability to communicate with His creatures. We are putting limitations on God. He can do whatever He wants. He can make Islam wajib for you but not someone else. It says, it's, it's haram for you to drink alcohol, but I didn't make this condition for someone else. Only you. So why are you judging this person? You know, you're judging them by the sharia that is governing you. Maybe they have another, another code in wujud. Existence has another path for them. That's one principle. The second principle, which is, I think, more subtle and more important, is that... If you look at the nature of the divine being, we find that Allah defines himself as asma. And what are those asma? Those asma represent ideals. They represent principles, which we call mabade and usul. So God is a set of principles. This is the nature of God. This is how he describes himself. He's, uh, he's al-hakim. So he values wisdom. He's al-alim. So he values knowledge. He's ra'uf rahim He's merciful. So he values these things. He's, you know, he's the just. He's the just. And, and so, if God is justice, anyone who has justice, God will look at them. God will appreciate them because God himself is justice. He says, you, you, have, you have my quality. You and I, we share this quality. So God, the first person God will look at is the one who has, shares his quality. If you have mabade, if you have usul, no matter what your religion is, you are the first person that God will look at because God defines himself as mabade and usul. Anyone who has principles, anyone who has justice, anyone who has mercy, anyone who has these qualities that God himself defined himself as, he's close to God. Because he has, he has divine attributes. So if you look at deen as, and knowing gnosis of God and understand that whoever has the principles that God has is close to God. Whoever has justice is close to God in the aspect of justice. Whoever has mercy is close to God in the aspect of mercy. Ultimately, we, we find تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ تَخَلَّق means to adopt. خُلُق Take in your own disposition and your own akhlaq. تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ 
God has akhlaq, God has, uh, uh, and his akhlaq is uh, his asma. What is, the, what is the divine character? The asma, the divine names, the just, the merciful, the, the loving. So when a person adorns these qualities, then, that, that, then they have actualized the deen in the real sense. Then they've Great. actualized Islam. Great. Um, Doctor, but here some may argue that um, Islam is the final religion, it's the Nasikh, it's the Khatim, it's the al and uh, Sharia is a main part of Islam and God wanted people to um, obey him or follow him or worship him through uh, the details of Sharia. Even in the Irfani doctrine they uh, emphasize on the role of Sharia uh, in order to reach to Tariqah and Haqiqah. So how come and we should guide others to this path, so how come they can also reach to the very high levels of spirituality, even if they didn't follow? Or this, is, uh, this will do to the uh, great um, uh, mercy of God and the great uh, just of God, um, that uh, they should find uh, their other paths also. Look, I mean, this goes back to the first, the, the first um, point, and, and that is that God created the human the human being from different trees in wujud, shajara. So, so every person has a tree that they belong to. This is the, this wujud, this existence is, is God's garden. And in this garden, there are different kinds of trees. And so maybe you're from a particular tree. You're from the tree of the Muhammadan tree. This is your shajara. You have intisab. You, you, uh, you're affiliated to this tree. You go back to this. This is your roots. This is your family. That's fine. So, so this, is, this is applies to you. But why are you limiting existence? Why are you limiting God's garden? Why, isn't it, can't you not entertain the idea that maybe there are, the, God has, has not given other people the hidayah, the knowledge or, uh, of, of this particular path, or they're not from, they're not, they're, they are not from this tree. Their kamal, their perfection is not in this. It is possible to to envision to to imagine that God made their perfection in something else. It was never to uh, like for example you find um, uh, I mean there's people that God creates of all kinds of walks of life. Some people they they they, they die as children. They die as adolescents. Some people are born with a disability. Some people are born with abilities. Some people are born, you know, uh, who is this, the, 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 the son or daughter of a Nabi or a prophet or an Imam. Somebody is, you know, and... A very high guided. IQ, for example, or... Yeah, there, there, there is no limit to God's creativity. What we are doing is we are trying to limit God by this idea of deen of Sharia, of the Arabic language. Do you don't think God speaks other languages? He only speaks Arabic? Okay, the Quran came in Arabic and we, we value the, the, the Arabic language. It's the chosen language. We, 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 we accept that. But he only, he, he only understands Arabic or he understands Swahili and, and French and German and the European languages in, in Hindi and Tamil and these languages but we have a superiority complex so uh, Arabic is the chosen culture it is the chosen language the prophet was an Arab it's just a, it's contextual it happened to be that way you happen to be maybe uh, related to the, the, the prophet as a Sayyid it happened to be that way God chose this but a person who looks at existence with an objective view and looks with tajarrud, looks with a vast perspective on, on life, will find that these ideas of nationhood, of, of madhab, of tashayyu and tasannun, all of these things are limiting. And they are very problematic when you look at it from the... Because the hakim... The Hakim, the wise person, looks beyond all of this. So these are all very narrow ideologies and very limited uh, types of thinking. This is, is it's limiting. Yes, it is limiting.
it has its function, but it's limiting. Can we say that it's a type of um, uh, identity e egoism, for, for example? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, there, there, is, there is something beneficial in it and there's something harmful in it. A person should feel proud of their culture, feel proud of their language, of their, of their people, of, of what have you, their dress. Their, these things are fine and they're acceptable, but what I'm saying is, is don't limit yourself to them. So it goes into this idea of jam uh, or tafriqa. So you are in it, and at the same time, one from the same perspective, you are detached from it. You accept it, you love it, you love your culture, you love your people, but at the same time, you find that you love also humanity. You love your neighbor. You love what is similar to you and what is different from you as well, but from another perspective. You love it because they are creatures of God. They're your, like Imam Ali says, either he's your brother in faith or he's your brother in humanity. So at least you share humanity with him. You share, you share you know, maybe uh, other qualities with this person, other interests. You may not share the deen, but you may share other qualities I with him. I think this person. verse also would help here. Like, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا ما أتاها. So different people are with different abilities, capacities, and uh, uh, different things were given to them. So e each person can find his path uh, within the things that were given to him, within the context that he's, he lives, lives in. Yeah, exactly. They, they are, uh, you know, so it, it allows for a more liberal perspective on the nature of existence and, and God's uh, mercy to his creation. Um, and I think that... Uh, the mystery you know, the, of ikhtilaf, mystery of uh, the diversity, maybe. Yeah, the mystery of diversity. There is, um, there is a great benefit in it, and this is why God created it. This is why God created nations and people and languages and, and different... Some say that this ayah, one of the goals of uh, creating the existence is the, the, the <laughs> It is the nature of existence. It is the nature. It has to be this way. Ikhtilaf is, is part, is the hikmah ilahiyya. It's part of divine wisdom. Isn't the nature of water and fire contrary? There has to be water and there has to be fire for there to be life. And these two contrary properties, they are at, at opposing poles of, of one another. And yet they gather in the same body. Insan has water and fire. Shahwa and ghadab. Yeah, exactly. Shahwa and ghadab or even in the physiological level. You know, we are, we're water, but at the same time, we have a nervous system, we have electrical currents and impulses in the nervous system. So insan is both water and fire, all the elements. And this is what makes insan unique is because God brought together all the elements, contrary properties within man. This is what makes insan, insan. Your insaniya is in contrariness. So from one perspective, you have to embrace ikhtilaf. Ikhtilaf means variety and difference because it is the nature of your being to be contrary the ruh and the jism are completely opposites one is immaterial and one is material totally material and one is totally immaterial so there you have the first ikhtilaf the fundamental ikhtilaf or the difference in the human being which is between the spirit and the body so similarly Human beings have an aspect of similarity and an aspect of difference. And if you don't embrace difference, it means you haven't actualized your humanity. And you will find that when you cannot only be around people who are similar to you, you have to be around people who are different from you. This is how you learn. This is how you grow. Sometimes, you know, Allah will, will force you to be. In fact, many times he will force you to be with people who you clash with. Because, like, you know, like, if you want to form fire, like in the olden days, they used to, you know, hit stones together. So with clashing, you have sparks of light. Light comes through conflict. 
through conflict, through ikhtilaf, without conflict, there would be no purpose of creation. There would be no humanity. There would be no test for Adam. The very first test was the ikhtilaf between the jinn and insan. That was the first test of, 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 in, in wujud. And here where also Arafat says like, um, each names of God, like, like, so even Bismillah al-Qahir or al-Jabbar or al-Mudil, or, or they uh, even see uh, wisdom in the Satan, the Shaitan, or uh, for example, they see that he's the manifestation of Bismillah al-Mudil. So even in this stuff, they can um, see wisdom. Yeah, of course. I mean, the ikhtilaf goes back to the Asma. Fundamentally, the, the conflict goes back ultimately to the divine names because there is a conflict within the divine names. And so if you look at, for example, some of the writings of Ibn Arabi and Qaisari, and he, so he's explaining what is the reason for Nubuwa. So the Nebi uh, represents on the metaphysical plane, not just Hidayah for man, uh, in the outward sense, but it actually represents the principle of justice between the divine names. So all of the divine names are are kept uh, in order through Ismail, the, the divine name, the just. So the Nabi is the principle of justice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is the, the fundamental principle which keeps everything in order. The whole universe in order is justice. Mm -hmm. Especially the Prophet Muhammad, when they say he is a full manifestation of all God's uh, names, all God's names and qualities, because so so in every incidence that the very precise and correct names, uh, correct name manifests in the life of the Prophet. For example, Al Rahma yeah. or Al Ghadab or Al Jalal or Al Jamal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the origin of conflict is within the divine names. God, this is the way God created the universe. He created the universe in conflict. And this conflict is uh, itself not necessarily to be taken in a negative sense. It's just the nature of things, the nature of wujud. It's the way it is. This is the nature of creation. And so we can look at uh, conflict and, and variety or differences on every level of existence, whether within ourselves, in, in socially, politically, in all these different arenas of life, so that we... And what is, like I said, you know, conflict... It helps you to reveal your true character. If you want to be, say, for example, you're a, like a fighter, a martial artist, a boxer. If you don't want to get hit, you go to the ring and you're afraid of getting hit. This is the wrong sport for you. This is not for you because you will never become a good fighter until you learn to take a, a punch. You get hit in the face and you understand how to deal with that you have to get hit because when you actually get hit in, in in a real situation then you'll know you'll keep your balance because learning to take a hit is a, itself a, a skill develop skill in the beginning you're very afraid and you don't want to get hit and you have this reflex but you overcome that and then you enjoy it or you like that type of confrontation so that it develops you as a fighter and this fighting skill the martial skill this whole thing is a part and parcel of the human experience without jihad and nafs without having a fighting spirit you can never move forward in life not spiritually and not materially in order to get what you want in life you have to struggle you have to fight for it you have to Fight your own self on in many occasions from your own laziness, from your own insecurities, from fears. These are the biggest obstacles. So you're you're fighting yourself. So you need to learn to fight and and have a you know there's a conflict that's going on. Every human being has conflict from the day they are born until the day they die. There's conflict. There's a conflict on the day they're born. The child is crying when it comes out of the womb. It's not happy. It was happy in the womb. It was comfortable. Now it's into the world. The mother's in pain and the child is crying. That's all conflict. It's a whole scene is conflict. The child comes into this world in conflict and it dies in conflict. How? Because he doesn't want to leave this world. But, but the angel come and he snatches the, the, the soul. So there's this conflict between staying in this world and wanting to and, and leaving. So tell me where, at which place in, in your trajectory from the birth to death there's no conflict. There's no, there's no struggle. 
It's the nature of wujud. Subhanallah. And uh, <laughs> here uh, I recalled uh, what, what Sayyid Haider al Amuli says in this book. For, mm. And this is the book that you translated, Jami'u al Asrar wa Manba'u al Anwar. Uh, he talks about a tawheed al dhati versus a tawheed al zahiri or al shakli or al what we were born with. So maybe this idea also will help that uh, tawheed al dhati is uh, available there in all human beings' life. It's, all, it's there in the fitra. They just have to realize it. And it's, uh, it's not necessarily to have the zahiri tawheed to reach to that one. Maybe you can explain here. Basically, the idea that the urafa including Haider Amli, is proposing or purporting is that Tawheed is not a verbal claim. It is not something you just say, La ilaha illallah, and you are, uh, you become a muwahid, you are a monotheist. Tawheed is a principle of existence. It is to understand the nature of existence in wujud, to see that God is one, and that oneness is, uh, is in all levels of being. The imprint, the that, ilahi, the that of God, the essence of God is, is God's signature. He signs everything that he does with this, with this signature. And what is that? Tawheed, oneness. So everything has a oneness. Everything has a unifying principle, including the human being. So, Tawheed is, an, is actually a, a process. It is not a state, one single state, but it is a process of arriving at a unification. At, it is arriving at the knowledge and the gnosis of the oneness of being, the oneness of God's existence. To, to move from a state of multiplicity into a state of unity and oneness and, and to see all things as one. So that is the nature of Tawheed. So it's Tawheed Wujudi. That's the meaning of, of, of what Amuli is talking about, Tawheed Wujudi. And for example, like, what is, okay, let, let's, let's take, take a practical, practical example. Now, we said that the body has, the, the human being has a jism body, has a nafs, has a khaya, nafs is a, is a soul, Khayal is imagination. He has uh, uh, aql, intellect, qalb. And within the qalb, there's a certain dimensions called the sir and the akhfa. And then, of course, the ruh. Okay? So I just mentioned like seven or eight things there. Each of these things, these parts, they're not really parts. There's only one thing. There's only one ruh. One thing. Human insan is one. Okay, the insan is one, and it begins with Allah saying, Alastu bi rabbikum qalu bala. God says, Am I not your Lord? And all the arwah, they said, Yes, obviously, of course, you are, you are the Lord. You are our Lord. Qalu bala. So, this is the origin of insan. Badra, the seed. The seed descends into this world, into the different realms, the world, awalim. Okay, from one stage to the next stage to the next stage, up until it up until it comes to this bodily dimension. Now, this is where the journey begins. So, this is the first journey, the journey from Allah into the womb, into the this this bodily form of the the human being, the human bodily form. Now, the journey begins back to God. So man's trajectory is from the womb, from birth, until ila rabbik al muntaha, and to your Lord is your end, your aim, your ultimately ila or ila rabbik al ruj'a. Your return is to your to your Lord. So all things are returning back to God. And now, physically, this is obvious. We are going from you know youth to adolescence to to, to maturity to old age and death. This trajectory is known. But inwardly, this is where human beings mostly falter. Because they don't come to the realization that insan has an inward movement. That he must travel. He must move from a state of animal haywaniya to insaniya. 
he must move inwardly and acquire this uh, a spiritual nature and this my friends is ultimately the the message of the prophets this is all they wanted to do is they wanted to get man out of a animalistic barbaric state into a state which god intended which is the human form suratuhu suratul haywan wa qal i'm sorry a suratu suratul insan wa qalbuhu qalbu haywan as imam ali says so he's ex- explaining man suratul ins- uh, insan he looks like a human but qalbuhu qalbu haywan meaning this reality is is, is still animalistic up until he starts to change and he transforms himself and then he becomes insan so this insan is you know it, it has its own uh, discussion of what that means what is insania as we said earlier it is to adorn the divine qualities and to become you know a uh, reflection great. of yeah great uh, this is your... tawhid Great, this is Tawheed. And you also mentioned about wisdom and opening ourselves to different manifestations of God and uh, widen, uh, widening our horizons and the, in, in the path towards uh, th- this uh, real transformation is to be open to different sacred texts. So for example, you say, why not reading the Bible? Why not reading the also other sacred texts? I, I recall that Alama Taba Tabai also, um, he was teaching his students, some of the special students, the uh, text of the Upanishad, which is a Hindu text. And he mm-hmm. was stating that I can find some of the, version, the verses which are very similar to Surah Tawheed. Um, so I think this is uh, something that also you'd like to say something about. Sure. This is a very good point you've raised and, and then really a, such an essential point. I think it really like highlights the whole discussion for today. I think that um, one of the major stumbling blocks for people, particularly religious people, is our adherence to the text more than the content of the text. We believe in the sacredness of the Qur'an or the Hadith or a particular text more than the sacredness of the words. Let me clarify. Ultimately, a person needs to strive for meaning, for content. And if a person strives for the hikmah, the wisdom, the meaning, they make that the criteria, then they'll find wisdom in all things, not just the Qur'an, not just your own text. Because this is accepted. We, all, we, we already accept that you know, the Qur'an is our, our, our sacred book. But even if we accept that on an ideological principle, as on, on the ideological plane, there's something missing, and that is to acknowledge that the real criteria and the value of the Qur'an is not that we believe that it is a sacred text or that it is from God, but the actual message that it contains, the actual wisdom that it contains. So we make the wisdom the criteria. And if you make wisdom the criteria for truth, then you can look at the Bible, you can look at the the Torah, you can look at other religious traditions, you can look at anything in the world. As the Hadith says, um, uh, uh, he takes a lesson the believer when he looks at a thing he takes a lesson anything he looks at he can look at good he can look at evil when he looks at good he takes a lesson when he looks at evil he takes a lesson but here maybe the, the issue of tahrif will come uh, about other sacred texts again tahrif is it's fine. We, uh, there's, there's nothing that has, it has absolute isma. Isma mutlaqa. Only Allah has isma mutlaqa. Okay? And from an ideological perspective, we say, you know, the Quran, it doesn't have tahrif. However, anything other than that, we use the criteria of the aql, the intellect. We gauge the value and the truth of a thing through it's truth value. It's how it corroborates with reality. We look at the hikmah of a, of a thing. Even though we can claim like maybe the Bible also, or what's a percentage that is muharraf and 
I mean, that's a that's a historical question. That is a as an archaeological question. It's not a question for the for the hakim. Mm-hmm. The hakim looks at context. He looks at the content. He looks at maani, meaning. Right. He says, you know, uh, the prophet says, "Khud al hikma." Something like that. There's a hadith which says, take the take a you know a piece of wisdom, even from the mouth of an unbeliever. Even if a okay, let me ask you this. If a liar, his 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 character is described as being untruthful, can he speak a word of truth? He can. Can you accept it? Will you accept a word of truth from a liar? Okay, a, an objective person, Hakim, a wise person, can. Why? Because he can distinguish between the person and the, the truth. The person and what, what he has spoken. The words he has spoken. Mm-hmm. So, he can distinguish between the two. If you cannot distinguish between the two, then that's a separate discussion. Okay, like for example, a report. We don't know. Like say, you know, this, this is a very common problem in like hadith science. Every hadith we, we, we encounter, we say, oh, da'if. Hada da'if. This is, <laughs> this, this is weak. This, this transmission is weak. Uh, you know, uh, we, especially like you look at some very famous hadith, and you reject the hadith just because of the transmission. Why don't you look at the content? Why don't you look at the content? Because the, the, the idea of the transmission itself is problematic. You're believing in the transmission, but you don't believe in the content. You don't believe in the hikmah. So the transmission, whether or not, how do we know that that transmission is weak? You said it's weak. It's a claim. How do you know the transmission is a strong transmission? Sahih. This hadith is sound. How do you know it's sound? It was something that was spoken 1,400 years ago when there was no electricity, there was no recording devices, people didn't have pens and papers, you know, people didn't even have you know, shoes to, to wear. And they're recording the hadith like, like you know, uh, night and day. And, and, this, <laughs> and, then they, and, then they, and then they make a system of hadith, sahih, you know, mursal and da'if, and all of this happened like hundreds of years after the Prophet. The hadith sciences evolved. It didn't happen in the time of the Prophet. Let me take the counter argument. So they, they may say that based on certain criteria that they've done, so the probability of the sahha will be more. Uh, so they, they're working with probabilities. Uh, some probability would be higher when they say sahih or hasan. This the, all what they can do. But then you can argue that even the taqimat of people, uh, they differ in it and it's, it's all a matter of probability. Look, when it comes time for realities and haqqaiq, you don't look at probabilities. You look at haqiqah, look at tr- truths. Probability is something you take as a second sort of a, 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 a secondary measure. The first thing you look at is that you weigh it against the aql, the, in the intellect. The intellect should, should gauge and should guide you first as the Prophet says, Al-Aqlu Rasul al-Batin. Rasul, is a Rasul. The messenger of truth, Rasul al-Haq. You want to know truth? Are you going to rely on Mursal and, 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 and Sanad? Or are you going to rely on Aql, the Rasul, Rasul al-Batin? Or even okay, they would say then, Haddathani Qalbi. This is yeah. Material. So the Qalb, the Aql. The Qalb and the Aql are the same from different perspectives. Qalb is a deeper version of the aql. So the, the aql or the qalb, it gauges things, it weighs things, it has the power of discernment. This is the power of the intellect. If you rely on sanad alone, it means you've given no authority to the intellect to decide. You think all of this technology that we're using, these recording devices, cameras, and iPhones, which does a million things. The iPhone is a, is a, is a, is a marvel of technology. You and I can't even understand what goes into, the, into one mobile device and how it communicates to the world. You can talk to anyone. It's a camera. It's a, a million things. One small device. This is from Hadith. 
This is from that you 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 made this device and you're you're controlling the world from this technology from hadith and, and Quran or from the aql. 90% of what you're doing, all this technology is happening in the Middle East, the buildings, the, the bulldozers, the, uh, the, the, the transmission, the transmission of sciences, the ulum, everything that's happening is from the aql. It's not from Quran and Hadith. So don't fool yourselves in thinking that this, you know, this Quran and Hadith is, the, is all that I need without the aql. Mm -hmm. The intellect is the thing which helps you to discern the Quran and Hadith, to understand it, to apply it to today's age. Great. Uh, How are we going to apply the Quran, which was, you know, which is stories of for thousands of years ago, Qom Lut and Aad and Thamud? What relevance does that have for today? Nobody knows. You don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows what that means. Ah, okay, we read it. You know, Khatm al Quran in, 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 in the month of Ramadan for barakah but that's and so the so religion is one category and aql is another category if you ask a doctor if you ask a scientist you ask the people who are on the cutting edge who are doing amazing things in this world all of this technology this broadcast right now is happening you know in two different countries two different continents through technology which is like astounding and this all came about from you know the human mind the aql bashari it didn't come from Quran, it didn't come from Sunnah, it didn't come from Muslims. No Muslim invented. Sony is not some Muslim company, nor is Apple, nor is uh, you know, Sennheiser, these, these companies who make all this equipment that we are using and we're harnessing and utilizing. Nothing came from the Quran and Hadith. So let's not fool ourselves as an, as a, as an ummah to believe that the, that, uh, the, the value the Quran, I'm not trying to devalue the Quran and Hadith. Don't get me wrong here. It, it, it needs to be in the context of the aql. That's why Imam Ali says, Qad aqlahu wa amata nafsahu. The first thing he says that he revived his intellect. He revived his intellect. Afala yaqilun, it says in the Quran, time and time again, do not think, do not intellectualize. What is this aql the Quran is referring to, the hadith is, Imam Ali is referring to? What is this aql? This is the same thing, this technology, this advancement, this understanding, discernment. So similarly, we use the same aql to use and to understand the Quran and Sunnah. And the higher form of aql is hikmah. When the aql becomes complete, when it reaches a level of, of completion Then it derives a principle A universal principle And this is called hikmah Hikam Plural So it starts to understand Wise wisdom And wise sayings Then that hakim Will start to investigate hikmah In all things You'll find that Allah's hikmah is in all things in creation, other books, and other philosophies, and other philosophical schools. Allah has <laughs> divided... <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, he, Allah has given knowledge and wisdom throughout the different nations, and different cultures, and different languages. So it's, you know, that's why it pays, uh, it's important to learn different languages, to learn about other cultures, to read their literature, to, to understand the mentality, and to see what gifts they have that Allah has given them. Exclusively, exclusively to them. So we we try to expand our horizons. Allah may as al umam wal hadarat wa shu'ubi may zat wa ibdaat wa khawas mukhtarif and a person should swim between different places. Yeah, exactly. Travel, see roof al ard. Travel. Say the Quran al Amr in the Quran. Travel the land. Travel and see and learn. And by travel and learning, you expand your horizons. And you, you, you see the ayat of Allah. You see the signs that God has placed in different parts of the earth with different people and different cultures. Different ayat come to you. So then you add to your personal experience. You add to your own personal development. And similarly, travel in the mind. Not just on the planet, on, on, on the earth. Travel in your mind. 
travel through different schools of thought, different philosophies, different time periods, different thinkers, read about different, um, uh, you know, uh, philosophical schools, different cultures and traditions. But this is this is travel. Uh, Doctor, Just because you travel uh, into and you read the Bible, and you turn, you know, you go and and you study the Bible, study the Torah, it doesn't take anything away from you. It adds to you. Just like if you travel to another country, you don't leave your home. You come and come back to your home. You travel, you enjoy, you see what that that country has to offer you, and then you come back to your home. So similarly, to travel through the Bible, see the different the different wisdom. Especially the Bible. I mean, I, I I strongly suggest that the Muslims should read the Bible. There's this is the statement of Prophet Isa alayhi salam, the greatest messenger after the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Great, great. And Doctor, talking about Ayatollah and the, you mentioned the Prophet Muhammad and the mystery of um, the, the the Quran or the mystery of the Kalima. Uh, in your article, the power of the spoken words, you say some Islamic metaphysics uh, metaphysicians argue that the word kalima refers to being itself and that it is the nature of being uh, to effuse uh, every plane of existence before reaching the plane of human language it is the sac it is the sacred pedigree that manifests through human speech and in intellect and gives rise to the idea that the human being has been created in the image of god so it's uh, talking about the mystery the secrets and the importance of the quran which is the great uh, miracle of the prophet i think also ben arabi has uh, very nice things to say here when he's when he compares between word and creation kun um, hmm. so he one of his sayings is know the existent beings uh, are the words of god which do which do not cease so the kalima al-ilahiya or nafas al-rahman which is the breath of the all merciful and also imam ali has has this saying that um, uh, God has manifested uh, manifested Himself in the book, but they don't realize it. So, so the mystery of the world and the kalima al-Qur'aniya al-Mutajalli ala qalb al-Nabi. I think you you mentioned that one of the major uh, uh, sides that we should discover the Avama of the Prophet Muhammad is through the Quran. So if you can explain a bit this idea. Sure, the, the whole idea, which is a a, a, a pretty uh, established idea that existence is the words of God, kalimat ilahiya. And all things, God spoke, and the first word he spoke was this idea of kun. Kun means be. And of course, it's, it's a metaphor, how it happened. These are all, you know, uh, metaphysical and spiritual asrar, and, and it's difficult to comprehend what, is, what does it mean that God spoke? What does it mean that he said a word kun? What does that mean exactly? Anyway, let's leave that for now. Let's just speak in, in metaphor right now. So God spoke, and that spoke came, uh, that speech came from this, this, this nafas, nafas ar-Rahmani. And this nafas ar-Rahman is uh, a term that the Prophet himself used. So it's not something that the, the Urufa just invented. It's a term that he himself used. This nafas, this breath, ar-Rahman, Allah breathed, in a sense, and he spoke this word. And this word is be, and, 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 and this whole existence is a manifestation of that word be, and, or, or in other words, you can say that everything is a word of God. But now, since wujud, or existence, can be described as the words of God, we can say that there are actually more than one word. There is the existential book, which comprises of the words of God, the existential book, Right, so this is kitab al afaqi or taqwini. Taqwin means existence, and then the second type of book is the book of the soul. Sanurim, as the verse of the of the Quran says, Sanurim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim. We will show them our signs, and our ayat refers to the signs, to the the words. Fil afaq means the horizons or wujud, al kaun. And fi anfusihim, and in themselves. So this is the one of the verses which is often used to, to describe this duality between the the divine words in existence and the the book of the soul. And then the third type of book is considered a kitab al tadwini, and this is the written book. And this is considered to be scripture or the Quran in in our in our case. 
So these three books of God, each one of them has a correspondence with one another. This is why Imam Ali says, "Ana Quranun Natiq." Right. Also describing the, the character of the Prophet, he's the, he's the spoken, the, uh, the the speaking Quran. And the, the, the heart. Quran. So the, the whole of his existence is a Quran, for example. Yeah, exactly, exactly. His character, the whole of his existence. He is the spoken uh, word of God. He speaks. He's the living word of God. The Quran is. It's a kalima to Allah also in the Quran. The, the that's right, exactly. Ahsant, yeah. And so, so this idea of kalima describing not only wujud, existence, and things. It also describes insan because Allah describes Isa as the kalima. Thank you for bringing that up. And and he says that he is a word of God. So insan is himself as a kalima. And of course, you know, if you look at Ibn Arabi and his, his whole book, Fusus al Hikam, we find that it's all, you know, al kalima, kalima ilahiya fi fasi, so and so. So he talks, he, he considers each prophet as a kalima. And this is something that's not uh, foreign. It's it's used in the Quran. It's there. So, so anyway, there's a mystery here, uh, Doctor, talking about kalimat and huruf. And I think Ibn Arabi also mentions that all the existence are kalimat and huruf and jumal of God. And w- when we read the Quran, we find also kalimat and jumal and huruf. And we find we, we find this huruf al-muqatta'a, which is also another mystery. And I think Sayyid Haider al-Amul in his tafsir, tafsir al-Muhit al-A'zam, or in, in, in all his uh, books, he talks about al-mutabaqa between kitab al-tadween wa kitab al-takween wa kitab al-nafs. So like, or, or, or as we, uh, always he say, like there, there are three levels, sharia wa tariqa wa haqiqa, or islam wa iman wa ihsan, uh, these three maratib, or here we have the nafs and the afaq and the, uh, and the tadween, so a person should do the mutabaqa. And here maybe we, we, we can talk about the mystery of the, 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 the personality of the Prophet who, who was the full mutabaqa between these three runs. No, I mean, you've, you've summarized it perfectly. This is exactly what it is. It's a mutabaqa or correspondence between the three books. And each one of them is a part of um, a, a larger whole. This, and this is what we mean by Tawheed, is to, to amalgamate the character of the Qur'an in the self. And, to, and also the Qur'an, it, it speaks to you according to your munasiba with it, according to your correspondence with it. Now, uh, there's a lot to be said about this. You know, uh, basically, I want to get to the point that the, uh, the, the character of the Prophet can be known through the book of God. There's no other way to know the prophet. We revere the prophet. We hear stories about him. And the, uh, there's two ways, really, the hadith and his statements and really the Quran, which is the miracle, which describes his character. So th- this is the, t- the, the two essential ways of knowing uh, the prophet, the insan, who is um, in the terms of the mystics, insan al kamil Right, so the the prophets they were themselves the perfect human beings, the exemplary human beings. Um, that's simply the, the the basic idea, you know. And if I can add to that a little bit, it'll say that look, the Quran came for the prophet. This is the character of the prophet. It's not necessarily not every verse applies to you and me. Sometimes it addresses. Uh, there's things. It, it's an it's an ocean, and it has mutabiqa to the to the qalb al nabi. It has a, a correspondence to the heart of the Prophet. And we have a share in that. We don't encompass it. He encompasses it. So this is a one we have to also be realistic with how we approach the Quran, how we approach the Book of God, the Book of Guidance. We're, we're like one ray of light from the Muhammadan light. So... Look at your wujud and your existence as being, is to see yourself, where do you fit into the trajectory of existence? Where is your, going back to our very first uh, issue that we talked about, knowing the, the keys to yourself, knowing what is your existence? What are you composed of? And the Quran will help you to unlock those mysteries. You will find correspondences with some verses and not others. Some verses are for you and some are not for you. They have no munasibah to you. So read the Quran as an intelligent person. Don't just 
go through the beginning from the beginning to end and just, you know, sing, sing the Quran, a nice tartil, you know, beginning to end. No, look at it from a perspective of like, this is the story of my life. This is the textbook of my life. This is the mirror of my soul. Let me see what I can find about myself through the divine book. I want to find myself in the verse. Look at it like that from time to time. You, I want to see what, what am I? Who am I? Will the Quran guide me to this? So if it's a book of guidance, then it will guide you to that. So that's why we say that the Quran is a mirror for the heart of the Prophet. It mirrors him. And here I would add, Doctor, that one of the beautiful mysteries about the reality of the Quran or the reality of the revelation, uh, just like they research in the philosophy of religion or some theologians also, they say, so what's the, the, the real essence of the revelation, uh, the revelation, when it happened, how it happened, uh, in a lahvat al-mi'raj, it, it, it's a lahvat fakana qab qawseyna wa adna, so, so. So what's the reality of such uh, revelation? And they try to think and present some ideas and theories. I don't know if Sayyid Haider or you would like to add uh, something. So, like it's, it's, it's a lahza where the Prophet reached to the highest level of fana and then he was in a lahza of unity where he gained all these realities. Uh, I, I don't know if you can explain one of the theories about the uh, revelation here as a summary. I mean, look, we, we have this idea of jam and tafsil. And, you know, inzal wa tanzil. So there is this idea that, yeah, on one level, the Prophet received it all at once. And another level that he had to, he, he had to, you know, manifest it uh, verse by verse in, in different parts. Now, remember that the Quran is itself, this word tajalli. It is the tajalli, the theophany, God's theophany on the heart of the Prophet. These are tajalliyat. And they've been codified as divine speech. So this is a divine God speaking. Whenever God speaks, like he spoke to Musa from the bush, he spoke to different prophets. So the Quran is the divine speech. So it's, it is speech is a tajalli. And there's different kinds of tajalliyat. This is a very important word that we should learn. And, to, and it really will, will un, unlock a lot of the conceptual framework that uh, the Orofa and the mystics work with. They talk about, especially Ibn Arabi talks about tajalliyat a lot. So tajalli, again, it's a kashf. Kashf means an unveiling. A, um, now remember, there, there was already, always a correspondence between the, 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 the fitra, the qalb of the Nabi, and the, rec the receiving of the Quran. So there is a correspondence. I mean, we're going to go into too many tangents, I think, if, you know, I think just the, the basic idea that to summarize this, these concepts, the Quran corresponds to the, the prophet, uh, the heart of the prophet. We have three books, Kitab Tadwini, Taqwini, and Anfusi, and each one of them correspond to one another. What that means by correspondence is that you can learn from each one of them, from the other. Each one of them is a sign of God, ayat, that reflects in the mirror of the other. So by working with these three things, you are in unison. You are, you are worshipping God in, in, in multiple ways. You are worshipping Him, you are seeing Him in the mirror of existence. As you are seeing Him in the mirror of your soul. And then you can corroborate those two with the mirror of the book. And it's necessary to see him in all three. This is when we really start to move spiritually. Doctor, I think uh, it has been a very uh, long and interesting uh, talk, um, sharing many different deep uh, ideas and theories about Irfan and about Wilaya and about uh, all these stuff. So if we want to make a summary of for, uh, for what we said today, or if you have um, uh, uh, any uh, things more to say. Sure. I just like to emphasize that everything that we've said so far about Arfan as a as a subject, it should not um, become uh, something alien for the, the common Muslim to contemplate. 
the reason why I say this is because we are very preoccupied with the acts of worship, salah, siyam, hajj, ibadat, and, 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 and the external or even like fiqh and jurisprudence. We're very preoccupied as Muslims in the external aspects of religion. So I want to take this opportunity to emphasize that religion is zahir and batin. Just like Allah says, huwa al-awwal wal-akhir wa zahir wal batin. And these are, these are considered to be the, the great four Ummahat al-Asma, the great names of God, that everything is under these four things, that He is the first, the last, the inward and the outward. So, Deen has an inward as well as an outward. Insan has an inward as well as an outward. In fact, everything has an inward and an outward. And in order to, to truly understand life, to be wise, to reach where you want to reach to fulfill your life, you must engage with zahir and batin. This is why the Prophet says, "At-tafakkur sa'atin khayrun min ibadat sab'in sana." What does that mean? He says, "Thinking, contemplating for one hour is better than seventy years of worship, or maybe a year of worship, sana, or sab'in sana, something like that." There was, a, if you look at the hadith, there's different versions, but the idea he's saying. Look at the scale of contemplation. Weighing that against one year of worship or a whole lifetime of worship. One hour of contemplation. How much ground you can cover spiritually, inside, intellectually, in your qalb through one hour of contemplation. This is where the heart of Islam is. This is the heart, is that the batin that cultivates your interior. He who cultivates their, this is jihad and nafs. The nafs is not external, it's, it's internal. Then when the nafs becomes rectified, then the limbs become rectified. Then your ibadat becomes rectified. Then your relationships with your neighbors and your, and your friends and your, your family becomes uh, rectified. Until the batin is in clean and pure, the person will never reach the station of you know, ikhlas, or 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 qalbun salim or nafs nafs you know it, you know um tumanina and all these different stages and stations we talked about inshallah we'll talk about in the next session about insan and the different stages and station that a person will go through in sayd and suluk Great. Great. Thank you, Doctor, for sure. all the information and the insight you shared with us and the wisdom. And inshallah, in the second part, we'll continue talking about uh, many beautiful uh, uh, things about Sayyid Haider al Amul and Ibn Arabi and uh, Manazil al Sa'irin and Ansari and uh, other spiritual stuff. Inshallah, we'll continue uh, inshallah. Uh, in a second uh, part. Uh, thank you Great. and salam alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, everyone. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah.